Saturday, December 6, 1941, was a, the evening. That evening was a pretty ordinary evening in Hawaii, which an ordinary evening in Hawaii sounds pretty good right now. Amen? <laughs> it was an ordinary evening. John McManus writes in his book, Fire and Fortitude, that that night most of the soldiers that were stationed there were out dancing, drinking, walking on the beach, relaxing. It wasn't because there wasn't a war going on. World War II was taking place, just that it wasn't going on there. It wasn't going on here, not in the United States. And it wasn't that there weren't warning signs of tensions that were rising with Japan. There were clearly a sense of kind of some imminence of something that was about to happen. In fact, that night, McManus writes, as the orchestra played the Star-Spangled Banner at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, Lieutenant Commander Edwin Layton, the Pacific Fleet's intelligence officer, stood at attention alongside everyone else. Having absorbed weeks of disquieting reports about Japan's belligerent intentions and the probable imminence of war, he felt the wild wild urge to yell, Wake up, America! But instead he stood still and he kept quiet. And he kept quiet not out of fear, not out of the concern of what people would think of him, but he kept quiet because no one was listening to him. And the reason that they weren't listening is because there was this sense of safety. That's, that's somewhere else. That, that's not going to happen here. We don't need to worry about that here. And yet, 748, on the following morning, December 7th, Japan launched a surprise attack with 353 Imperial Japanese aircraft. And as a result, it was a result 2,403 lives were lost that day. Again, not because there wasn't a war going on, not because there weren't warning signs, but because in our safety we got comfortable. And when we get comfortable, it is so easy for us to get complacent. And church, this morning, I, I want you to hear this. I believe that we face that very danger, especially as the church in the United States today. And it is the reason that we are spending this time as we launch into this year of fortifying as a community. It's the reason that we're spending the start of this year in the book of Revelation. We're going to go there again this morning. I want you to grab your Bible. Turn with me to Revelation. We're in chapter 2 and we're going to be in the last, the last of, the, of the letters in chapter 2. We'll get into chapter 3 next week. But this letter, the overarching theme of Revelation is this is Jesus' wake-up call to the church. It's Jesus saying, wake up, church, because there are things that are coming. There are things that are going to be happening, and and you need to get ready for them now. Jesus, throughout this letter, is pulling back the curtain on the future. And and for us, we know that ultimately what's coming is Jesus. Jesus has made the promise he is coming soon. And we know how the story ends. We just sang it a few moments ago. right? He's coming again, and and his victory is for us as the church. It is our victory, and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and he's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes and, and there's going to be no more pain and there's going to be no more, no more suffering and no more sickness and no more death and we're going to be free and we're going to be in his presence where there's joy unspeakable pleasures forevermore. That's our hope and Jesus is encouraging us with that hope because what he's also telling us is that between now and that moment it's not going to be easy. We're going to face challenges. We're going to face difficulties. In fact, it's going to get harder. It's easy for us, I think, to start to, to hear this. In fact, I believe some of us hear it and we go, yeah, that doesn't sound like that's what's going to happen here. I think we're safe. I, I think we're secure. It's exactly what many of the soldiers were thinking in Pearl Harbor the night before it happened. We're, we're safe. We don't have to worry about this. But Jesus is saying, listen, guys, you need to understand there's challenges coming. There's going to be affliction that is going to lead, Matthew 24, to the love of many growing cold. There will be many who walk away because of the challenges and the persecution and the hatred. We're in the spiritual battle where there is a real enemy. And he's on the move and he's, he's, re, he's, he's acting in resistance against God and the church. And he's going to continue to ramp up his attacks the closer that we get. And it's not just someday out there, one day, you know, it's so far away we don't need to think about it. Listen, 2,000 years ago, in the opening verses of Revelation, John writes, the time is near. And the last words of Jesus is, behold, I'm coming soon. It's why Paul in, in Romans chapter 13 says this, besides you know, and I read this last week, but, but we need to keep being reminded of it because we, we live as if it's not reality so often. 
We nod our heads on Sunday and then we go back to living the same way Monday through Saturday. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake up. Wake from sleep for the salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Paul 2,000 years ago could go, hey, we're closer to Jesus' return than we've ever been before. 2,000 years later, I can confidently say we are closer to the return of Jesus than we have ever been before. And the need for us, Grace Point, is to listen now, to respond now, to engage today, that we would wake up. It's the whole message of Revelations, but... Revelation, but particularly in chapters 2 and 3, Jesus is dictating special messages to each of the seven churches that this letter is addressed to. Where he is giving them very clear instruction of how to get ready. But again, it's not just for them. In every single message to each of the churches, Jesus says again and again to us, we got to listen. Because as much as he was speaking to them at that time, through his messages to them, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us today. And we need to listen and respond. And the big picture message is is that as the church, we've got to focus on health. We've got to focus on pursuing strength, courage, and endurance. That's what it means to fortify. We've got to focus on pursuing being the healthy church that is obedient, submitted, and faithful to Christ that we've been called to be. But the, the reality is this. Health is not something that we can force. It doesn't just happen by us sitting here. Health is facilitated by engaging in the right disciplines and the right practices. And what Jesus is giving us in these letters is those practices and disciplines. Look, you want to get physically healthy, then there are things that you got to keep doing. You're doing some good things. There's some things you got to stop doing. And then there's some things that you've not been doing that you got to start. That's, that's true all the time. If we're going to be healthy as a church, there's some things we've got to keep doing. In fact, most of the messages that Jesus writes to these churches is going, look, there's things you're doing. That's great. It's good. Keep it up. But then there's correction because there's things you're doing that you've got to stop it. They're setting you up for failure. They're making you unhealthy. You've got to change those. And then there's some things you're not doing, and you've got to start doing those. And, and that's really the focus of our whole year is that we're looking at those practices and saying, okay, so what, what, what does Grace Point need to do? If we're going to be ready for what is now and next, where do we need to, what are the things we need to keep doing? What are the things that we need to stop doing? And what are the things that we haven't been doing that we've got to start doing now? And the message, uh, the big idea in the letter that we're looking at to the church in Thyatira this morning is this. If we're going to fortify, if we're going to be ready for what's now and next, then we have to resist complacency. That apathy that spiritual passivity, we've got to resist complacency. And, 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 and here's how we res- resist it. We, res- re- we resist it with expectancy. And, and I'll show you what, you what I mean in this passage this morning. Would you stand with me? Let's pray and then we'll, we'll read together. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you that, Holy Spirit, that you have something to say to us this morning. Your call is for us to listen, and so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to hear what you have to say, but not just hear it, that we would keep it, that we would do it, that we would live it. That we, Grace Point, would be the church that you, we would continue to grow to be the church that you've called us to be. That the things that we need to keep doing, we do it. The things that we need to stop doing, we cut it out. And the places that we've been maybe apathetic or just, just never been challenged and stepped into those, the things you're calling us to, that we would, we would we'd be obedient. Lord, you intend to teach us this morning. Help us to hear and, and obey. Lord, speak. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. 
and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken to pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is God's word. You can go ahead and be seated. Each of these cities and churches have things that make them unique from one another. Thyatira as a city was unique is that of all of the cities, it's the smallest. Uh, And the church, by the way, would have been the smallest of all of the churches. One of the mistakes that we make about the size of churches is we think that the size defines significance, but not to Jesus, because here in, as he's speaking to the smallest church, he's writing the longest letter. (laughs) He's got the most to say to that church. It's not about the size. Jesus sees this church in this town that that was considered to be insignificant. He says, significant. But it was considered to be an insignificant town. It was not a destination, right? This is not the place that you would be going to for a vacation. This is the place that you'd be going through on your way to vacation because it was considered the gateway to Pergamum. Pergamum, you remember last week we said it was the Washington, now you might not actually go to Washington, D.C. on vacation, but it was the Washington, D.C. of, the, uh, of, of Asia, modern-day Turkey. And uh, so uh, Thyatira was considered kind of the waypoint. It was the way that you would go in order to get to Washington, D.C., to get to the capital. And it was designed really as a military outpost. It, it, it wasn't beautiful. There wasn't a lot to it. It was really designed to slow down invading armies that may have been coming towards the capital city. The thing that made Thyatira, particularly the church, so unique, though, is what's missing. It's what's not happening in the city as compared to all of the other cities. Did you notice what was missing as we read through the passage? It's persecution. It's persecution. All of the other letters up to this point in time, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, all of them are facing really intense persecution. I mean, to the point of death. Some of them are being persecuted by uh, unbelieving Jews. Jesus calls them synagogues of Satan because they're slandering the church. Their goal is to get them arrested, thrown into prison, and hopefully killed because they want to see them wiped out. On top of that, they're being persecuted by the proponents of the, the religion of the empire where you're to worship Caesar as God. You're to worship Caesar as Lord. And if you don't do that, we're going to kill you. And add on to that, that the Roman Empire was basically a pluralistic, it was was filled with pluralistic religion, right? It was all about, look, we can worship everything all at the same time. And and by the way, you can have your Jesus as long as you don't say that he's the way, the truth, and life. And no one, well, you can say that. You just can't say that no one comes to the Father but through him. Right? You can have the first part of it, but don't have that part. As long as you say we're all okay and we all can worship and get to the heaven the way that we want, you're okay. But if you're not, we're, if you don't say that, we're coming for you. And they are, I mean, we're, again, we're talking persecution to the point of death. death. We saw it last week in Pergamum. You got Antipas who's killed because he refuses to bow the knee to Caesar. And then you come to Thyatira and Jesus doesn't mention a single word about any persecution that's happening in the city. And I would say it's not that there's zero. You got to remember they're in the Roman Empire. It's, there's lots of persecution going on. But he doesn't address it because it, it seems that they're in that city where there is no synagogue. There's no temple constructed for the worship of Caesar. There are not really any temples built to any of the gods in that city that's so small and insignificant. It seems that in a world filled with persecution of Christians unto death, that in Thyatira there's some general basic sense of safety in the church. We're not facing it. And that might sound like really good news. Like, boy, that's the place you'd want to live. I mean, it's, it's a lot worse to be Antipas, right, over in Pergamum and being killed because you won't worship Caesar. It's better to be there. But here's reality. The reality is, is that as as spiritually dangerous as persecution can be. That sense of cultural acceptance and safety is, has just as much spiritual danger for you. We got Christians that are being killed around the world for their faith. We're not facing that same level of persecution. And you might think, okay, that's a good, like we're safe. 
But see, that safety is dangerous because in safety we get comfortable. And when we get comfortable, it's easy to become complacent and to stop doing the things to, that we're supposed to be doing, engaging in our relationship with God, and to start drifting. Look, we do it physically all the time. I was talking with a friend of mine this last week who was sharing about how he was having all of this pain in his body and he realized that his problem was he wasn't stretching. He never stretched. And so he started stretching. And lo and behold, as he was stretching, he stopped having pain. It's like, it's, a, it's amazing. I was stretching and I wasn't having pain, but what's the problem? When the pain goes away, what do you do? You stop stretching. I, I got to the place. I don't need it anymore. The problem is you still needed it. That's how you got there, but that's also how you stay there. And when you stop, the pain comes back and that's where he is now because he stopped stretching. See, we do the same thing spiritually. We go, oh man, it's so, we, we don't want to be going through the difficulties and the trials and the persecution. And yet when you're going through them, there is this deep sense of, man, I just, I need Jesus. I've got to be walking with him and I've got to be in his word and I've got to be praying and I've got to be coming to church and I've, I've got to have this faithfulness and then we get to these places of sim- this seeming security and safety and everything's kind of clicking and we start, what happens? We start drifting. We, stop dis- we start disengaging. And see, that's, that's really what happens in Thyatira and it stands as a warning to us as a church. Last week, the warning was you gotta watch out for the enemy. He's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. The warning this week is you gotta watch out for yourself because you and I, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. Not just in the trials, but I would argue especially in that comfort where I so easily get complacent. We've got to fight complacency complacency in our lives and we resist it with expectancy. Three points that I'll give to you this morning. Number one is that you face the danger of becoming desensitized to sin. You face the danger of becoming desensitized to sin and, and all you need is time, exposure, and complacency. Time, exposure, and apathy. It happened in Thyatira, it can happen at Grace Point, and it can happen in your life. I've said it before, but it is worth saying again. Past faithfulness is not the guarantee of present faithfulness. Past victory is not the guarantee of future victory. We saw it last week with Pergamum. They were doing so well, and yet what happened? We're seeing it this week in Thyatira. They're doing so well, and yet what happened? Jesus starts with encouragement. Look at verse 19. I know your works and your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. He's saying, look, there's good things that have been happening. You have love, which has led to service because that's what love does, right? Love isn't about me. Love puts me in a place. I love God and I, and I love others. And, and so my focus isn't on me and what can I get out of this. I'm, I'm living to serve others. And I, I, I'm grounded in faith, trusting in God's word. My life built on the truth of his word and on his promises. And where does that lead? Well, it leads to that life of patient endurance. Because as hard as it gets, I know that his promises are true. And the overflow in their lives is that he says, look, unlike Ephesus, that got to the place where they needed to go back to the beginning and get back to the things that they did at first. Look at what he says. He says, your latter works actually exceeded the first. You were progressing, but now here's the problem. You have en- you've embraced a progression that is actually a spiritual digression. You're, you're drifting. Which is a shock because you go, how does a church go from that to where Thyatira finds themselves because where do they find themselves? Well, look at verse 20. But I have this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. And it's not just that they tolerate, they're actually not just permitting it, they're actually participating in it. That's where they've gotten to. He says, you've got a problem. The problem is in your community, there is a woman and her name is not actually Jezebel. I, don't, I actually found out somebody, I said, nobody names their child Jezebel anymore, right? Uh, actually, I was told after the last service, they met somebody actually named Jezebel. Um, <clears throat> but most people don't name their child Jezebel because even if you don't know the story, you just know the story, right? That name is associated with evil. That name is associated with all sorts of sexual immorality. Jesus is not actually naming the person, but describing them by referencing the Jezebel of the Old Testament. You go back to First Kings, Jezebel, a pagan foreign woman who becomes the queen of Israel by marrying King Ahab, the king of Israel at the time. Ahab, uh, he's a pansy. He, he's a weakling. He's not really a king. He's a puppet. Because who's really in charge? It's not Ahab, it's Jezebel. 
And Jezebel comes in with a plan. And the plan and her intention is to get Israel to stop worshiping Yahweh and start worshiping her God, and her God is Baal. But understand that the strategy isn't overnight. It's not like she comes in and goes, okay, you stop worshiping Yahweh now, and let's all worship Baal together. No, her plan is a slow cook. It's a slow progression where I'm seducing, and I'm drawing, and I'm calling you. It starts with, well, you can worship Yahweh and Baal at the same time. Remember, uh, Elijah has the confrontation with the prophets of Baal under Jezebel, she's killing all the prophets of Yahweh while supporting the prophets of Baal. And there's a confrontation on Mount Carmel. I actually got to go to Mount Carmel for the first time this year, stand on the top of that mountain where it happened and to read the story. And Elijah, you remember, he confronts Israel and he goes, how long are you going to kind of waffle back and forth? He says, you're limping between Baal and Yahweh. How, are you, how long are you gonna do that? And, and the limping back and forth is, here's why we're limping back and forth, because you cannot worship two gods at the same time. You can't worship two things at the same time. You can only truly worship one thing at a time. And so if you're worshiping Baal, you're not really worshiping Yahweh. If you're worshiping Yahweh, you're not really worshiping Baal. And the problem is you're going back and forth between the two. And, and, and by the way, you're doing that because this is where Jezebel's leading you with the goal that eventually you go to Baal and you never go back to Yahweh. And Jesus is calling this woman Jezebel because he's saying, do you understand? This is who she is. This is what she's doing. She's teaching. You're permitting her to do it, but she is misleading. And in the process, she's seducing people into a life of disobedience to God and replacing worship of him with the worship of something else. And in the process of worshiping something else, participating in sin and disobedience, sexual immorality, and eating meat sacrificed to idols, which that eating of the meat was a participation in the actual worship, of the gods, those idols that they're actually sacrificing the meat to. And he's saying, the problem is this. Thyatira, the things that once were abhorrent have now become acceptable. The things that you once knew, again, this isn't where you started, it's where you've drifted to. The things that you once knew were serious sin have now simply become no big deal. You didn't just give permission, you're actually practicing it, which is the opposite of the progression that's meant to happen in our lives. Right? The, the more that I grow, the more, spirit, the more I mature spiritually, I'm not going to become more comfortable with sin. I'm going to become more uncomfortable with it. I'm not going to become desensitized. I'm going to become more sensitive to the sin in my life. If you want a picture of it, look at the life of Paul. If you read through his letters, you can, you can get a sense of the progression of the perception of his self and the awareness of how deep sin actually goes into his life. In uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. He starts with kind of the top-level leadership. This is early on in his ministry. He goes, look, all the apostles, kind of the top of the leadership, I'm the least of them. But then later on in his life, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles. He goes, okay, we started with apostles. Now I've progressed to the point where I'm the least of the, the, the believers, all the saints. And then we get towards the end of his life, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Paul goes from I'm the least of the apostles to I am the worst of sinners, not because Paul started following Jesus and he's grown to be worse, a worse sinner than when he started. No, Paul is progressing in holiness, as, as he's progressing in holiness, he's becoming more aware of the reality and the depth of his sin, not just on the surface of his behaviors, but all the way deep within his heart. He's becoming not desensitized, not more comfortable, but uncomfortable and more sensitive to his sin. See, that's the progression that's meant to happen, but it's the opposite in Thyatira. And it's not with everybody, but what Jesus says raises a question for them. Who is it? Who among us is going down that road and has been, become desensitized to that sin? And for us, it should raise the question, is, is, it, is it possible it's you? Is it possible that it's me? Is it possible that it's us? And, and look, the challenge is you've got to be honest with yourself and you've got to be honest with Jesus because you can play spiritual religious games every single week on Sunday morning and trick everybody in the room. But I want you to get this. You cannot fool Jesus and you're not doing yourself any favors. 
You're keeping yourself stuck. You've got to be honest. Is it possible that there is sin in your life that you once saw how really bad it was, how horrific it was, the fact that Jesus had to die for that sin, and now instead of being broken heart of it, over it, you've gotten to a place of figuring out how to justify it. Is it possible that the way that you use your words, you've gotten comfortable with using them in ways that you once were very uncomfortable with? Is it possible the things that you're consuming, the relationships that you're engaged in, the the things that you're participating in, is it possible that the drift has happened in you? And if it is, Jesus is saying, listen, you can't wait. You've got to deal with it now. We've got to get after it. But even if it's not you, even if you're sitting here going, Dan, that doesn't apply to me, it does apply to you. Because if it hasn't happened, you have to understand it can. It can. And we have to address it before it happens. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. You see, the seeds of of great sin exists in your life. And all it needs is the right environment. You've got to address it now. And if we're going to address it, you've got to understand it. You, You face the danger of becoming desensitized to sin. How does it happen? How does a church that is so faithful get to a place where they're participating in these things? How does a believer who's so faithful get to this place of being desensitized? Point number two, we become desensitized when we stop dealing with our sin. When we stop addressing it in the way that God has called us to address it. And again, remember, it happens over time. It's not an immediate shift. Right? It's one step at a time, one compromise at a time. All it takes is time, exposure, and apathy, engagement, participation, even just being around it without addressing it. I, I was talking to someone this, this uh, week who was sharing how they're going back and watching the old, some of the old horror films. And by old, they're, they're talking, I think, 80s and 90s, which is unacceptable because that's not old. Um, but anyways, they're watching not so recent horror films and they're talking they say i love going and watching those because they're just now they're laughable the things that used to make us afraid those things they're like jokes now compared to what what's happened you see now there's see all it's taken is time exposure and a progression over time in the film industry to where we got into the point where horror films that are coming out, I don't watch horror films, but I've read about recent horror films that when they've been played in theaters that people are literally vomiting in the theater because they're so realistic, so horrific, so violent, so graphic that that's where we are now. And when we get to that place, the things that we once considered to be a big deal, they're no longer a big deal. The same thing happens spiritually. Listen, David did not get to a place where he committed adultery with Bathsheba and murdered her husband overnight. It happened one step at a time, one small compromise at a time. Thyatira did not get, actually rewind for a minute, go back to Israel and Jezebel. The issue with Jezebel didn't start with Jezebel. It happened well before Jezebel. Ahab married Jezebel because he was already at a place of spiritual drift. Not, Israel was not dealing with the sin in themselves. That's how he got to the place of Jezebel being there and then to the place where they're actually compromising and worshiping Baal. In Thyatira, it didn't start with this woman. It started well before we got to this woman with a church that stopped dealing with sin in themselves. You know what they weren't doing? They're doing the very, they weren't doing the very thing that Jesus is calling them to do in this passage. They weren't repenting. Right? Jesus says that Jezebel, verse 21, she needed to repent. She's refused. He says there's people in the church that they need to repent of her, their, of her works, verse 22. And they need to repent because they weren't repenting. And the thing about repentance, look, the word repent, it means, uh, we, talk, we often talk about it as turning from sin to Jesus. And, and what I would say is that's the outcome of repentance. The word repentance means a change of mind, a change of heart. The mind and the heart are connected and they are the internal control center of your life. When you repent, what you're saying is, my life is not my own. I've been bought with the greatest price. I'm not the master, I'm the servant. I'm not the owner, I'm the steward. And therefore, I'm giving up control to you, Jesus. And when I give up control, I'm turning from sin, right? I'm going from sin to obedience in that moment because I'm surrendering control. The thing about repentance is it's not meant to be a one-time deal or, or, or just from time to time when things get really bad. Martin Luther said all of life is repentance. And, and, I, and I agree with him. It's all, all of life is repentance. It's meant to be a constant 
thing that's taking place in my life because do you know what my problem is? My problem is I have been bought with the greatest price. I'm not the owner. I'm the steward. But you know what I do is I wrestle back control. I go, yeah, mine. <laughs> uh, this is, this is, it's my life. I, I want to do what I want to do. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not the owner, I'm the steward. I'm, I'm not the master, I'm the servant. But I want to be the owner. And I want to be the master. And I wrestle it back. And so therefore, what do I need to do as a follower of Jesus? I need to keep giving it back. Lord, I've taken it and I was wrong. And I'm confessing it and I am repenting. Lord, I've acted like the master and I'm the servant. And I'm sorry and I'm giving it back over to you. And I've got to constantly, daily, be doing this. And, and listen, some of you may say, boy, that just sounds really dreary and depressing and if that's the way it sounds to you and if by the way if that's your experience of repentance then you're doing it wrong because listen repentance on the one thing on the one hand repentance does you know what it tells me i I am a a real sinner (laughs) i have great sin in my life and i stumble and fall in many ways it is a sobering reality but you know what repentance reminds me of at the same time yes i have great sin but i've got a greater savior Because I, listen, Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. I am the worst of sinners, but I've got a great Savior who has loved me and gave himself for me. And he is faithful to forgive me. He's just to forgive me. He never fails to do it. And there's so much joy in it because he loves me and he forgives me. And it's constant. It's always. He never, ever fails. And so we're meant to be engaging in this constantly. But hear this. When I don't, when I stop. And it's easy to get comfortable and complacent and to stop engaging in that way. If I stop dealing with sin in my life, guess what I'm going to stop doing? I'm going to stop dealing with sin in the community. And here's the progression. I don't deal with my sin, so I'm not going to address your sin. And so we're going to permit it. And then as we permit it, we get time and exposure in our apathy. And then there's the spiritual drift as we're desensitized. And we get to the place where, listen, Thyatira, five years before this point, I guarantee you they're going, we would never do that. Five years before that, they're going, we would never affirm that. We would never accept that. But they've gotten to that place like the frog in the kettle over time, one step and one compromise at a time. And you want to talk about a relevant message for the church in our country right now. This is epidemic. It's happening. And we've got to be watching and we've got to be dealing with it. Listen, you face the danger. It happens when we stop dealing with sin. And why do we stop dealing with sin? We stop dealing with sin because we forget how urgent it is. We forget how serious our sin and we lose our sense of urgency. We lose our sense of expectancy. And the expectancy I'm talking about is that, yes, Jesus is coming back, but it's more than that. Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to hold me accountable. He's going to hold Grace Point accountable. We, we will stand before him and we'll give an account. When we forget that, that's when we drift. When we lose the expectancy of it, and by the way, it could be today. When we forget it, that's what happens. And by the way, Thyatira forgot it. Why? Well, look at, look at Jezebel. What does she call herself? What's the title she gives to herself? She calls herself a prophetess. She's not called that. She's not appointed by God to it. She's appointed herself. And as a prophetess, she's a false prophetess who is in the church, who is doing exactly what Peter warned was going to happen in his second epistle. Listen, he says, there's going to come a time, false prophets are going to come into the church and they will, bring, they will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. You go, how is it that she has so much power? Because here's what those false prophets are doing. Here's what they're saying. Verse 4 of the next chapter, chapter 3, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? Guys, it's been 2,000 years. 2,000 years of denying ourselves. 2,000 years of obedience, 2,000 years of sacrifice. You've got desires and you've been saying no, taking up your cross and following. He hasn't come yet. And by the way, they say, if he hasn't come yet, hear this, 
Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, it's not going to change. If he hasn't come yet, either he's not coming soon or really what they're getting to is going, he's just not coming. And if he's not coming, why the urgency? Why are you living the way that you're living? Relax, lighten up, have some fun. Don't be so serious. Don't deny yourself. Listen, you've got desires, follow your desires. You've got a heart, follow your heart. You've got feelings, follow your feelings. Just itch the scratch. Just satisfy the the craving. Live for yourself. You got plenty of time to do the holiness thing. Get to that another day. And Jesus is coming to the church and he's going, no, you don't. He says, let me just remind you who I am and remind you what's coming because look at how he introduces himself. He always introduces himself. The very first thing he does, look at the first verse, verse 18. How does he introduce himself? The son of God with the eyes of fire, with the feet of burnished bronze. He says, I'm the son of God. Second person of the Trinity, the one who has been given, as he says later on, authority by the Father. As the Son of God, he's King of kings and Lord of lords, and he has authority to do what? To judge, to hold accountable. And as the judge, he has the eyes of fire, and the eyes of fire represent his ability to see and know everything. He says, the church needs to know that I'm the one who searches the heart and the mind. I don't just see your behavior. See, everybody else here around you in the room has no idea what's going on in your heart. You can hide it all day long. You can put on the nice clothes and look like you've got it all together. The reality is this, Hebrews chapter 4. Everything is laid bare before Jesus. Nothing is hidden from his sight. There is nowhere that you can go from his presence. He knows when you sit. He knows when you rise. He knows what you're going to say before it's even on your tongue. He is fully aware. And listen, the feet of burnished bronze represent the fact that he is ready to come. He's on his way. He's on the move. And the reason that he has not yet come is he's not being passive and he's not giving permission. He's giving time, being patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance because he's coming and there's going to be accountability, not just one day. Understand, there's accountability now. He says, this Jezebel, listen, I gave her time to repent. She didn't repent and I'm going to hold her accountable now. And by the way, those who are participating with her, I'm going to hold them accountable unless they repent. There's an opportunity. It doesn't have to be this way. You can repent and not have that be the case, but I'm holding people accountable now as a precursor to the ultimate accountability that is going to happen when I come again. I will, what does he say? He says, I'm going to give you all according to the things that you do in the flesh. I will give to each according to your works. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. There will be an ultimate accountability for all of creation, but you need to hear this. There will be an ultimate accountability for the church. We will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and the question will be, what did we do with the life that he gave us? And uh, listen, I could give you a whole nother sermon. I won't, not right now. But here's what I will tell you. Read look, 1 Corinthians. One day we will go before the eyes of fire of our Lord. And for some of us, it will be revealed through fire that we built on the foundation of his grace with junk. And that we wasted the life that we were given. And we will be saved, but as through fire. Because again, we're not saved by what we do. We're saved by Jesus Christ. He's the foundation. He is our hope. He is our salvation. But it will be revealed on that day. And there will be some of us who suffer loss. Because we did not walk in faithfulness. But for some of us, it will be revealed that we built on that foundation with a life of faith and love, of service and faithful endurance doing greater works than where we even started and it will be shown that we built with gold and silver and precious stones and on that day there will be reward. He references it here in this moment to the one who conquers, to the one who faithfully continues the, my, d- d- doing the works that I've called you to do. I will give you authority. I'm going to place you over cities and, and I'm going to give you responsibility in the coming ki- kingdom. Having been faithful with a little, I'm going to give you even more responsibility. There will be reward and the challenge is... Listen, in light of that, you've got to listen and respond now. Don't wait. Because it's soon. You know, he says to the one who conquers, I will give him the morning star. Do you know, the morning star isn't a what, it's a who, in spiritually speaking. The morning star is Jesus. 
He is the morning star, the bright and morning star. The morning star is that light that rises in the sky just before the day. It's actually a planet, and it is bright, telling us that the day is almost here, the sun is almost going to rise. Jesus is the morning star. He's saying, I'll give you myself, but he's the morning star. Why? Because when he ascended back to the Father, rising up into the sky as they watched him go, it was a sign that the day is almost here. We are almost at the moment of his return. We have a limited time. We need to respond now. The time is now. And how do you respond? Look, three things. Number one, it's an invitation to believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord now. Some of you have been playing religious games your whole life. You come to Grace Point consistently. You go through the motions. You sing the songs. Maybe you give. Maybe you even serve in a ministry. And maybe you even know all of the answers, all of the lingo, all of the, you know, all the explanation. If somebody were to ask you, there'd be no doubt in that person's mind. You, you clearly know Jesus. But the question is, do you? Because you can play all the games and have no idea, have no relationship with him. The invitation is to believe, to surrender to him as Savior and Lord. You cannot earn it. You do not deserve it. He's done it all. The invitation is to receive the gift. Accept that you are accepted. Receive the free gift of God bought and paid for by Jesus through his birth, life, death, and resurrection. It's already been paid for. Receive it. The second invitation is that if maybe that drift is happening in your life, that you deal with it today in repentance. You've been taking control and it's time to surrender it. And to not wait. Now is the time. And the third is that if you say, well, that's not me, then then what does Jesus say to those who have not? He says, those who don't hold to these teachings, the end of verse 24, he says, I don't lay on you any other burden, only hold fast to what you have until I come. Stay faithful. Keep following after him. It's what Paul tells us in that passage in Romans, Romans chapter 13, where he says, we got to wake up. The time is at hand. He says, so then let us, as we know that that's the day, let us then cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, and not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. If we're going to fortify we got to deal with that complacency. We do it with the expectation he, he's coming soon. Let's pray.